Hello, we're here today to talk to you about our sustainable development goal, which is no poverty, which is the first development goal of the United Nations. I'm Jake. And I'm Spencer. Let's get right into this. All right, so our SDG goal and target, um, our sustainable development goal is no poverty. It's goal one. And the target we selected is uh, target 1.1, which is eradicating extreme poverty for all people everywhere at all levels by 2030. Yeah, so what even is extreme poverty? So extreme poverty is defined by the UN as living on less than $1.25 a day. And currently around 6.9% of the population lives in extreme poverty. So um, recently, sadly, extreme poverty has risen because of the coronavirus pandemic, along with other exacerbating things like the war in Ukraine, pushing millions into um, refugee status and into poverty. So this is a very dire issue right now more than ever. So what are some root causes and impacts of extreme poverty? Well, there are many causes that overlap with each other. Uh, one, companies that use exploitative labor practices uh, keep their employees impoverished. Uh, two, the lack of infrastructure towards education, housing, and clean food and water. Three, natural disasters, which destroy infrastructure, which we'll be talking about later, um, as well as climate change, uh, which kind of speeds up the natural disasters and makes it worse. Um, and inequitable access to job opportunities and educational services. All right, so who is really um, affected by extreme poverty? And when we talk about extreme poverty, you'll often hear the words global south, which references many people in sub-Saharan Africa and in South America and South Asia, which are affected disproportionately by extreme poverty. So, um, yeah, so for the first time in two decades, the share of workers living with their families below the international poverty line increased from 6.7% to 7.2%. So an 8 million additional workers were pushed into poverty recently. And the places that this affects the most is the underdeveloped nations. So if your nation is already struggling with poverty because of the pandemic, that issue became even worse. All right, so here we have um, the local child poverty rate here in Ohio. Um, as you can see, it went from a, I mean, it's all unfortunate, but an unfortunate 18% um, to an even worse peak of about just under 24% in 2011. And recently it's kind of stabilized back to, um, back to where it was in 2005 again, uh, as you can, may or may not be able to tell underneath the title of the graph, it says an estimated 18.2% of children in Ohio lived in poverty in 2021. Yeah, so often when we think about poverty as Americans, we think that this is something that, this is something that doesn't affect us because we're a wealthy nation. But in reality, um, lots of states have people that are impoverished, um, especially in the South, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia are states with very high poverty rates. Um, and even here in Ohio, we have poverty rates that would be surprising to a lot of people, especially foreigners who hear that America is supposed to be a place without poverty. All right, so now we jump uh, to the global impoverished population. Um, as you can see here, um, this has uh, the stats for all like different parts of the world. Um, so you can see Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, is uh, very heavily plagued by it. Um, Oceania is about half uh, percentage-wise, but that's still pretty awful, um, followed by Central and Southern Asia. Northern Africa and Western Asia, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, um, and then the whole world in general. Um, you can see it tallied up at the bottom there. Yes, yeah, so we can clearly see that this it disproportionately affects those who live in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Oceania and countries like Indonesia. All right, so uh, as you can see on this map here, um, the places that are most affected by extreme poverty are all in Sub-Saharan Africa or um, somewhat close to North Africa. And these are the parts of the world that are being hit the hardest by extreme poverty and they really lack the infrastructure and tools and funding to be able to 
um, bring themselves out of poverty. And they also are facing exploitation from many multinational corporations, which we'll talk about really soon. All right, so let's talk about some policies, some strategies, and some solutions. All right, so you want to communicate with your legislators about stopping companies that use exploitative labor practices. Now, the United States has legislation that prohibits companies from using child labor or slave labor, but these laws are constantly uh, bypassed through loopholes that need closed. Um, consumers, you, can also do their part by buying from companies with fair labor practices. If you recall um, about the uh, cocoa trade and stuff, um, Dr. Kopish showed those like um, companies that are basically approved by how they um, don't exploit their workers. Um, and you can see others like Nestle that unfortunately do. Um, so that's like a sort of guide you can follow. Um, that being said, it is not the responsibility of consumers to stop unfair labor. Um, it should be the responsibility of companies that do it and uh, the world governments and um, wealthy nations also need to invest in foreign infrastructure, kind of foreign aid kind of policy that can lift people out of poverty um, with things like schools, universities, and hospitals. All right, so um, when we're looking at visible power, who has power, who sets precedence for things in the world, um, we're looking at a lot of uh, lobbyist groups and also just our own legislators themselves. They set the policies which allow certain cocoa companies and other manufacturing companies to use slave labor and have those products come into the United States. So, um, you know, locally, um, even in America, institutions like banks, your city governments, all of those things contribute to the policies that either lift people out of poverty or keep them in poverty. So, um, when we're talking about visible power, we mean the people that really set the standards and precedents and the law for these types of policy. So like our, uh, our national government, our state governments, and our local governments all do that to an extent. All right, so hidden power, um, which creates unjust conditions. Um, a lot of these examples are actors in um, what affects or influences such a policy. Um, and the, some things also have an agenda, uh, which we'll certainly get into in the next part um, about invisible power. So um, you see things like lobbyist groups, social media, corporations, religious ind institutions and educational institutions, um, really like universal, you see these all over the place. Um, clearly everywhere from local to national to uh, global uh, scales and um, yeah, celebrities and think tanks uh, also exist nationally. Um, you know, you don't really see those a whole lot at the other levels, but otherwise a lot of these are kind of universal. All right, and uh, invisible power. And when we're talking about invisible power, we mean more of the ideological side of things. So things that aren't necessarily structured, but more of ideas that people have. And um, a lot of what drives uh, economic policy today is kind of left over from the Cold War and from the West's fear of communism and from the spreading of communism and that entire situation uh, that the world was in a few years ago. That still informs a lot of our understanding of how economics should work. And in our opinion, that should not be the case. We need to have new ways of thinking that lift people out of poverty other than um, capitalist individualism and things like that. And um, also with religious ideologies, uh, Karl Marx once said, religion is the opiate of the masses. Religion um, can keep people very complacent in where they are. Religious leaders can often tell people to um, stay complacent with their current working conditions because they will be rewarded in the next life or that revolution is sinful. Um, so all of those things and all of these ideologies um, like Cold War rhetoric and just capitalist conservatism, um, these all influence the institutions that create policies around this. All right, so what do we do here? Well, consumers need to stop supporting companies that exploit their workers, um, keeping them in poor conditions. However, it, like we said before, it's not really just the responsibility of consumers but of governments to regulate them.
um, the U.S. government should not tolerate products being made using slave labor, which we all know they do. Um, and wealthy countries need to hop on that foreign aid and invest in infrastructure in underdeveloped places, um, which in time will translate to sustainable wealth, generation wealth. Yeah, so um, our recommendations about banning products and services that use slave labor from other companies um, also ties in a lot with our belief that infrastructure needs to be built in these places because lots of times um, money is sent directly to alleviate hunger or to do things in the short term in terms of medical aid and um, hunger and things like that. But what we believe in is that infrastructure needs to be established. The money needs to be put towards infrastructure like hospitals, schools, universities, roads, transportation in general, because those are the tools that they will use for the long term, not the short term, to be able to build well. And that's why we believe that our goal is more of long term oriented than many others. All right, so uh, who are some stakeholders, uh, our constituents that can help us advance these policy ideas? Well, governments of the world, it's as simple as that. Um, like we said, they regulate them. Um, they decide what to tolerate and what not to tolerate. They must regulate these industries to ensure that the workers are paid fairly. Um, and through this intervention, we can also make sure that these nations have proper infrastructure um, to continue to build sustainable wealth. All right, so um, for our foreign policy, we just believe that nations that have the ability to need to invest, not donate, but more so invest in these nations to be able to have them uh, build their own wealth and have infrastructure that helps their citizens to alleviate themselves from extreme poverty. So um, this, we think, is not like a handout. It is something that's good for everybody. It's good for the entire world when other nations are able to lift themselves out of poverty and have real functioning economies that aren't based off of exploitative practices, but are based off of fair labor practices. All right, well, we're probably going to leave you here because we can't play this video, but we want you to watch it uh, right now. So, we want you to watch it. Yeah. So, so th hopefully thanks for joining us. This was